morning audience and good morning also for our audience in YouTube. Uh, welcome. Uh, the Habibi Center is really glad for finally we have, uh, we are able to invite uh, our fellow academicians, students, experts back to our office because the, you, as we know, the COVID-19 pandemics have, uh, get, are getting better in Indonesia and hopefully it will get better and even better um, in the future. And my name is Lutfi Ramis. Um, I'm a researcher at the ASEAN Studies Program at the Habibi Center. Um, today, I would like to welcome you all to our uh, public lecture series. And now, when we heard about China, we would think about a force of 1.4 billion and also major economic influence in the world, not only to its surrounding nations and regions, but also to beyond. With an economic bomb started about 30 years ago, today's China is not only opened its door, but also step out of the door and explore beyond. Not after 2013, when we heard about President Xi Jinping unveiled the One Belt, One Road initiative. And the Belt and Road initiative as the preceding initiative uh, came up in 2016. And now the initiative has covered more than 70 countries around the globe. We know that Belt and Road initiative is often translated to a transcontinental long-term policy and investment program which aims to promote the connectivity between Asia, Europe, Africa, even to their adjacent seas. In a world where we, we know that at the same time, development infrastructure gaps, hegemonic rivalry, and the Belt and Road Initiative, which expects to inject trillions and trillions of outward fundings, we have equations in our mind. How far has the Belt and Road Initiative walked so far? How far has global political chessboard seen its impact? And most importantly, where is it? Where is the uh, Belt and Road Initiative within the dynamics of global connectivity today? And to explore and answer this question, I would like to welcome Dr. Malik Ayub Sumbal to the Habibi Center to help us figuring, figuring out this one. And today's public lecture of Belt and Road Initiative in Global Connectivity Context. Dr. Malik Ayub Sumbal is an award-winning journalist, geopolitical, uh, uh, geopolitical analyst, commentator, and moderator. He is a journalist and also the founder and the president of the Caucasus Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome and good morning, Dr. Sambal. Um, it's an honor to have you here today with us. Now, before we get into the lecture, um, Dr. Sambal, could you give us a bit of keywords about what is the lecture about today? Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Habibi Center, uh, to arrange uh, such, an, uh, such an important topic uh, to discuss. And uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, to Mr. Mohammed Ansori, the executive director uh, for this initiative. And uh, the topic uh, which uh, we are going to discuss today is uh, uh, the connectivity of the Belt and Road. That uh, we have seen that uh, the world is passing uh, through different kind of uh, emerging scenarios right now. We have uh, a lot of conflicts. Uh, we see that the era of the Cold War is back. And uh, at this time, especially the countries, uh, uh, third world countries, uh, the developing countries have are in a very uh, decisive and in a very important position because their importance is increasing every day. 
that how they should react and how they should act uh, between the emerging powers. So to do, to, to, today we will talk about uh, the initiative of the global connectivity uh, in the context of the Belt and Road. So uh, I also thanks to all the participants, academicians, and the scholars, and those people who are uh, watching us live on the YouTube. Uh, that uh, that uh, we will try to explain uh, what we see uh, because I am the uh, person who is witnessing uh, one thing: the China outlook uh, to the world. Uh, since last five years, I am based in Beijing, and uh, what we saw and what I have witnessed uh, that is totally different. That is reported by the Western media. Because what Western media is telling about China, that is not actually what, what I saw in the last five years. Because Chinese are not what the Western media is portraying their image. So Chinese have a business mentality and the future is based on the shared future. They would like to engage partnerships, uh, countries around the world. They are trying to uplift the economies. They are trying to help uh, the deprived countries and the, those colonies who has been deprived by the West. Because the Western uh, model of the governance is totally different as compared to the Chinese model of the governance. Because this is the development of the China that we have seen. They have overcome a uh, million of challenges. Because it is the population as mentioned in the introduction, Mr. Ramiz, that it is the population of the 1.5 billion. So the responsibility of the Chinese leadership of this 1.5 billion population is very huge. And they, are, and they are delivering much better than the Western models. Because we see that the Western model of the governance, uh, the democracy model is not much serving the people. So the people ultimately want that the, what is the, what is the uh, outcome or what is the desire for the common people. A layman who is, uh, who is just uh, involved or who has been engaged into the daily problems or into his livelihood, he, he don't uh, bother about which kind of the governance system they have. At least he is getting all the facilities of his life. So if he, if he has been delivered very well, so it doesn't matter that what is a democracy or what is there. So uh, President Xi model of the governance, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, that is one of the uh, most uh, uh, delivering model of governance right now in China. And many other countries are trying to adopt that, uh, of course, Chinese have some, uh, some great model of governance that they uplifted such a huge number of the population from the poverty. So uh, I will formally start uh, my presentation. And uh, I, would, I would go from my uh, first point that the Belt and Road is actually uh, the main crux and the main, uh, main point of the Belt and Road is connect, uh, communication and connectivity. Because when you see that there is a, uh, there is a, there is a very healthy communication when there is a connectivity, there are roads, there is a, uh, there is a trans uh, communication and there is, a, there is a movement of the goods from borders to borders. So of course that will come the progress and the development. Without connectivity and without roads and the bridges uh, and without the movement of the goods, the economy uh, would not be thrived. So the the basic theme of the Belt and Road is actually to connect the world and uh, and to and to uh, and to deliver. So, so blocking communication and uh, the connectivity is actually deprived the countries and uh, communities from the development. So, this is one of the major aspect and point of the BRI. So, so when we talk about the BRI, so we see that the West. And the Western countries come up with a lot of very uh, weird and uh, very uh, one-sided 
kind of the uh, propaganda. So, so West to see because the the Western model of governance I explained before is totally different than the Chinese governance system. China is engaging communities and countries in the partnership. The West they have colonized, they occupied, they come with the militaries, they they bomb, they occupied, and then they go back after grabbing the resources. So this this uh, shared future on the base of the win-win is actually one of the problem that the West see that their hegemony is going to end. So that's why the West is involved into a lot of uh, topsy-turvy and a lot of conspiracies against the Belt and Road. But ultimately, uh, the people and the countries, more and more countries are trying to join this uh, BRI initiative. And uh, right now, I think uh, more than 70 countries uh, are into this initiative. And uh, I think that every day, this progress is going on. So uh, when we talk about the BRI, then we see that uh, there was one uh, world order that has been implemented by the United States and its allies. But at this time, we see that there is an Eastern world order that has been establishing very fast in the countries and the communities. And the people from the Asia Pacific and all the other regions, they think that it is only China who can have in a position to offer uh, the shared partnership in the development sector rather than the Western countries because the West see that, uh, uh, we see that in the Middle East what happened. It was, a, it was an oil rich region. But in the Middle East we see that all the dictatorship empires that has been uh, actually initiated and uh, that was stand up by the Western uh, consensus the West, one by one, conquered them all. And now we see that uh, the Middle East is going to in a massive unrest. So again, I would like to explain more about a little the, what is China's BRI? So in the main, the principle I, I mentioned that there is a connectivity and the communication. So the other aspect of this is that uh, to building the infrastructure of the countries. <clears throat> so those countries who have been war torn, that's just like Afghanistan. So what did the United States in Afghanistan and its allies? So Donald Trump said that we are, we are throwing the mother of all bombs on Afghanistan. So, so they have been bombing this country for the 20 years without without anything that there are human beings, they are actually, the West is the so-called champion of the human rights. But when it comes towards the bombing on the people, I think they have very shameless and double standards. So after bombing 20 year Afghanistan, they just leave abandoned Afghanistan and go back in just like one day, pack up and went. So now the yeah, Afghanistan is isolated and uh, the development sector. So who is coming and trying to build this country now? So the China is coming to these communities and countries who are, who are deprived and who have not resources, but the China is trying to take them into the partnership. So the partnership is based, of course, on the win-win and the shared future. So this is the idea and the theme that has been presented by some Eastern leader, and that is coming from China, Chinese President Xi Jinping. A progress and prosperity is one of the another aspect of the Belt and Road. And then on top of this is the development on the basis of the common destiny and goal. So uh, yeah, so this is one of the uh, major aspects. Again, about the, when we talk about the shared future for mankind, so what this means actually. So I mentioned before that the China governance system and the Chinese model have delivered. And according to which model this system has delivered, so that is the socialism with Chinese characteristics. Those who are 
actually have problem or they think that the socialism with Chinese characteristics is something that is uh, that irritate them or they are feared that this development and progress will spread throughout in the world or in major countries of the world. So I think that uh, this is one of the system who can root out and who can fish out the people from the from the various problems and into the various economic challenges. And uh, the Western ideologies, uh, we never see anything coming from them that is based on the shared future and something like that kind of doctrine. So again, so what is the, what is the problem for the West right now is this that especially those developing countries where the Chinese projects are thriving and uh, the wheel for the progress is, is moving on. Uh, in those countries, the West see and West think that their control, they are losing their control on the powers and the nerves because they have the pressure groups there, they have different factions, uh, they have different kind of the lobbies there. So when the West is trying to lose the control, of course, they have the propaganda tactics in which they could engage the societies and to make propaganda against the this development. But for those countries who are actually in this progress or in this prosperity, uh, to stopping China or countering China mean that to stop the development. Because right now, uh, who has more uh, initiative for the global developments? So that's only coming from the Chinese side. Yeah. So the Western hypocrisy and double standards. I I repeatedly talk on this, and uh, I think that this should need more to discuss because this is the thing that uh, that the Western media is projecting too much. How much the Western uh, double standards are exposing every day? So they have they have totally different standards when it comes towards the when it comes toward their own. They have. They have different parameters to judge for their own people. When it comes towards the other countries, they have they have totally different mindset. They never talk about the human rights violation. They never talk about the uh, how many sexual assaults has been America. We never seen the human rights where their interest is damaging and collapsing are uh, and overlapping. They completely neglect and they never talk about those those human rights problems. So the West has uh, set double standards and ultimately they have the backing of the media that is funded by the huge conglomerates and simultaneously they have the uh, NGOs and multinational companies to whom they are ruling the world. So the Western double standard should need to be exposed every day more openly. And the second thing in this that <clears throat> the Western division. We see a lot of Western division right now. The union, uh, you see in the European Union that what kind of the drama has been created in the, in the episode of the Ukraine. I mean that they have destroyed and they have escaped goat such an important country just for their own sake interest. So what Russia is doing in Ukraine? Because it's just like border with the, uh, uh, just like uh, what America is doing in Ukraine, because it's just like the border with Russia, and from 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 Kiev, uh, uh, the Moscow is just like a few hundred kilometers. So it's just like the uh, revival of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We can say that, like by, back it happened in uh, uh, at the time of uh, I think in 60s. So the Western double standards is also one of the major issue right now. So uh, what we see here that. Uh, that an emerging emerging multipolar world, uh, we see a new world order and uh, a new uh, emerging multipolar world is actually uh, the need of this R when there is a lot of conflicts. So the one power corridor is not in the favor of the countries and the nations. So uh, the emergence of the more uh, partners and uh, key players would definitely uh, negotiate in a better position rather than there is a one country uh, who will decide the future of the world. So uh, again, I say that uh, this is a, a revival 
and emerges of the Eastern world order, uh, in which uh, we see that uh, uh, the future for the Eastern nation and the uh, developing countries is more. Uh, so for me, uh, what is the future of the BRI? That is the uh, most important uh, point and the most important aspect. So China is trying to uh, trying to send this message and trying to improve and trying to enhance this BRI wherever and uh, at, uh, at whenever they are trying to do this. So we see that uh, with, the, with the Chinese role model and uh, the countries who are engaged in the BRI uh, according to their own interest and according to their own understanding with China. So I think that the future of the BRI is bright and uh, uh, more and more countries will join this initiative. And I think that uh, this partnership is the global partnership of the China in which we will see that uh, the majority of the countries are getting benefit, not only China. Because actually, uh, China is sending uh, the goods, but of course, on the other side, the countries have to, because China is one of the largest buyer in the world right now. So if Chinese are selling something, of course, they need uh, much more from the, from the world that they could send and they could sell it into the Chinese markets. So Chinese markets are one of the major, like the, for the international buyers, for international sellers, they are much attractive and uh, I think it's opening up. So China's opening up and uh, the cooperation with the world is increasing through this Belt and Road Initiative. So that is the end of my, this brief uh, presentation. So we can go now for the uh, question and answer session. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sumba. Therefore, before we open the Q&A uh, session, I would like to remind uh, our audience on YouTube as well, you can also uh, write down your, answer, your question on the chat box, and our team will also see if there is a YouTube question coming, and I will read that uh, to Dr. Sumba. So in summary, Dr. Sumba, um, you have uh, presented a, 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 a short but really significant um, uh, new knowledge that you see uh, Western hegemony is foreseen to met its end, while China uh, is foreseen to to be giving guarantee to Eastern World Order, and it lead also to multiple world order, which it gives opportunity to developing countries to grow on and, 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 and thrift, which uh, we can also see it through the BRI and um, which the BRI itself uh, is building, the, uh, the, the, the bridging the fractures, the gaps, and it gives the shared future, as you have mentioned earlier, which it was never taught actually by the Western hegemony. And um, interestingly, one of um, um, in one of the presentations, one of the slides that you have presented, you mentioned that countering China, countering China is the main, uh, one of the highlight of the measure taken by the Western power. But it also means stopping the world uh, growth. Um, before I uh, receive question from our audience uh, here in uh, the Habibi Center and on YouTube, I would like to give maybe a bit of question uh, in regard to this. Um, how far have the BRI given impact to the uh, developing countries right now, Dr. Sumbal, in regard to the, whether it's in regard to the development, their development, their economic benefits, as you have mentioned that Stopping China means stopping the world growth. And how is actually um, the BRI in this uh, context of connectivity and development? Uh, it's a very good question. And uh, when we talk about China, we see that 1.5 billion population and simultaneously as such a half of the world GDP, we can talk about this. And uh, the economic share of the China is almost half of the world when we see about the economic strength and the economic capability of this. And uh, right now, China have the potential to build and to, and to engage countries 
I just give you an example of Pakistan. So, China has invested almost 60 billion US dollars. They have upgraded the electricity. Before China, there was the 12 hour electricity problem in this country. Chinese come and they make a lot of electricity resources. They are building mega projects in Pakistan. They are uh, working on the Gawadar port, which is one of the deepest port in the world. So, the Chinese are giving a boost. They have made a network of the roads and bridges. So, if you see that the China-Pakistan economic corridor is, is the basic of the Belt and Road. And so, we see, so the Western countries have the problem with this because the West is always try to keep Pakistan under its influence. They want that Pakistan should be under the trap of the IMF. They would exploit Pakistan's strategical importers and then use them according to them. Because after 9-11, Pakistan was a key player with the United States in the war against terror. And, you, and being a Pakistani citizen, from the United States, we only got wheat. And they promised us F-16. We never got that F-16 so far. So China is our Pakistan defense partner, simultaneously boosting the economies. So we see a lot of propaganda by the Western media. Sometimes they are creating such a nonsense issues that it's hard to believe. So this is one example. So Chinese are where they are going. They are dealing according to their own and according to that country atmosphere. Mean that they have not the intervention. They are not, first of all, they are not interventionist. They never intervene into the internal politics. So, this is the Western style of the governors that they come up and they regime change. They try to, uh, uh, try to buy the country's uh, lobbies, groups, politicians, whatever be there. So, this is their role model. We have not seen in the China's case. So, so similarly, other countries, they are. They are, they, have, uh, they are very open and uh, they are much eager for such kind of the cooperation. So, uh, similarly we see in Central Asia, they are connecting the roads and the uh, trade going on toward the Europe. So, this initiative is actually has a huge potential. If we talk about the very rationally and very objectively, the Belt and Road is, is, is one, of the, uh, one of the leading project in the world according to the, uh, according to the new technologies and uh, the new terms because the world is transforming and in this transformation I mean that when we talk about the global village it's not that we should close the border because west is closing the border it's china that is opening up and they are trying to engage part uh, communities countries very openly so if west have something to offer they should come with a com competition mode they should not come up with something like the cold war mentality so their mentality is like that, that just like in the ring of the boxers, if somebody has not capability, he will come out from the ring and start breaking the atmosphere. So they are in this position that we will not play and we will not let play the others. So that is actually the game and uh, it's, not the, it's not the rules of the game. If you, are, if you are trying to have the competition with the innovation and the development, you should come with that ideas rather than trying to and become a bad guy and to create problems. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumbal. I would like to give opportunities for our audience here. Um, please. Good morning, Dr. Sumbal. It's Pleasure to meet you finally uh, in person. My name is Ibrahim Roman. I'm from School of Strategic and Global Studies, University of Indonesia. It's very interesting presentation. It's always interesting to see somebody not from China clarifying what's going on in China. Because usually Chinese diplomat will be working hard to, you know, to explain what's really going on, especially with regards to Belt and Road initiatives. Pak uh, Sumbal, as my background is economics. I want to kind of to, to bring this discussion a bit from economic point of view. I totally agree that uh, Belt and Road Initiative will facilitate a better competition between a better 
competition between countries and trade flows between countries. But the problem is competition will not happen uh, without uh, having a similar level of playing field. And if we see from the data, I mean, the empirical data tells us that no countries have a current account surplus against China, not even North America, not even Europe, and including Southeast Asia. It means that the initiative will, uh, you know, be tending more into widening the gap of a trade balance rather than narrowing the gap of trade balance. Because, you know, if we talk into the root of problems, the root of problem is, you know, clearly the gap in labor productivity. I mean, they have a huge, uh, you know, much bigger level of productivity compared to other countries, probably only Vietnam, which is coming closer to China right now with regards to the ability to produce goods. So what is, what is your opinion on whether this initiative will be widening, widening the, the gap, economic gap, because of, um, you know, um, disparity of productivity, or it will be closing the gap uh, between, between uh, countries? Because I think uh, the fact is that, again, China is um, the powerhouse of pretty much all goods, yeah, all goods uh, and, and products now be it a high quality product, cheap product, and medium product. So that, that will be a huge challenge for other countries to catch up. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, that is also a very important question. And uh, being you have a very economic background, so it's really uh, point out very clear direction, yeah. So the economic, uh, you can say that the trade balance. So I think that this is the, this is the countries who, uh, who are engaged in partnership with China. Uh, they have to deal and they have to think about this because if they have the much trade balance, so Pakistan and China, I again give the example that they have the trade uh, imbalance because a lot of coming from China but very less going from Pakistan. So the Pakistani government is not taking any initiative. If there is the best, pa Pakistan can become the fruit basket of China because China is uh, importing fruit throughout in the world. We see that from the Latin America, from all the countries, I mean they are importing the fruits. So, uh, similarly, in South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and Southeast East Asia, the, there is a huge potential that they can capture the Chinese market and they could earn even the same and the trade balance could be reduced uh, if there is any trade balance. So in terms of the Vietnam, I am not, I'm not much expert on that specific case which you are talking about, but I think that uh, uh, when the countries will get uh, more confidence and uh, the traders and the investors will definitely move toward the Chinese market. Because, uh, of course, Chinese, uh, the, other, uh, the other countries, trader, businessmen, they should have to touch the market. If they will, if they will say that the China is a no-go area for them, of course, they will, not, uh, they will not explore these markets. So the Chinese markets are more attractive and lucrative as compared to the Western markets. So we have a, just like a schema and a, uh, the Western, uh, you can say that the idealization is too smart and too uh, too attractive for us. That that the in Asian Pacific they have always think that the Western markets are have something like this, or they are most lucrative for the investors and the businessmen. Actually, this is not because the Chinese uh, China has been going through like a huge revolution. It's not China like the 50 years before. It has been transformed into a very very modern society especially into the uh, digitalization and the supply chain. They have a very smooth system of the supply chain. In this COVID, we see that how they have uh, maintained this supply chain throughout uh, the country, uh, throughout the inside China. So I think that uh, it, 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 could be, uh, it could be covered up with the passage of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stambal. Maybe uh, Mr. Abraham won't like to give it back. No? Okay, thank you. Is there any other? Okay. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sumba, for coming into the Habibi Center. Uh, I'm Tao Fan, also from the Habibi Center. Um, I have a series of questions for you, uh, actually. Um, you were talking about the, I think it's, it's, it's again, I follow your, 
liking your opinion on the presentation as this is very interesting coming from you with no background in uh, China whatsoever. But um, the PRI itself, there is a certain belief uh, in 2017 from Brahma Ashalani. I, I believe you were, um, um, uh, you acknowledge this uh, coin t uh, term, which was coined by him, uh, the debt trap diplomacy. Uh, this, this was actually going on in Sri Lanka, right? And, and there's also a high belief that Indonesia, if uh, um, mismanage this BRI would end up like Sri Lanka. Uh, do you have any? Do you have any opinion? This is the first question. Do you have any opinion on how Indonesia would uh, could or could avoid this mistake uh, uh, made by Sri Lanka government? The second question is that um, I know this BRI is uh, merely or purely economical for developing countries to, to develop more. Uh, but then it also relates to political and to a certain point also security. For example, the growing dependence from Indonesia, also ASEAN to China could lead to a non-collective approach to China, right? For example, if you take a look at the South China Sea negotiation, for example, there is a certain dilemma from certain states to to deal with china in 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 the in the negotiation and the third question you're you're telling us about the propaganda of the u s is the dat trap diplomacy considered as a propaganda from the u s or are there any type of other Propaganda from the US. Thank you, Dr. Sumba. Thank you, Masulfi. Yeah, it's a also very important point, and I think that this debt trap is one of the uh, uh, one of the important uh, point because it's it's heavily heavily dominated by the Western media because the, this this terminology used by the Western media. In case of Sri Lanka, no, I don't think so. That that is the debt trap of their current situation. That is the political instability. Because the Prime Minister and the President who was there, who have, who have much supported by the Western countries, they have ruled and the people are definitely bored because they did not deliver. So when, the, when there is a continuous regime, when they have an authoritative regime on something on the people and they are not delivering, of course the people will come out on the roads and the protest and the agitation. And then the West has this kind of the you can say the features that when there is kind of some sort of the uh, some some uh, some problem, they they exploit. They have the tools of the exploitation because they create sensationalism. Because the Western media, the tools, social media, everything is in their hand. On Twitter, we see that they can make thousands of trends, but the left-right voices are always dominated on the. Uh, by the by the by the rightist they have dominating the leftist views so sri lanka is not the case people are saying now even in pakistan because they're saying that pakistan will also be the same situation there but 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 we see that the ground realities are not there it's totally different it's not the case what we have uh, seen in in the case of the sri lanka so the western media is trying to make it more propaganda in the case of the sri lanka and they are they are using this card because the debt trap is one of the major conspiracy and uh, one of the titles which they are using to uh, to come to China. Every country who is engaged with China, they just say debt trap. What is the biggest trap of the IMF? Do you know Pakistan is the in the debt trap of the IMF? And you see that how horrible in that uh, they are controlling the prices. They say that we will decide the, what is the electricity price. We will decide what will the petrol price. So there is no more debt trap dangerous than IMF. And uh, regarding, regarding Indonesia, I think Indonesia is doing quite well. I don't think so that this uh, Sri Lanka case could be make a reason comparison with the Indonesia. When the Indonesian government is doing something like uh, 
uh, on the very much mutual consensus and uh, where they feel comfortable. They are dealing on that level. And uh, I don't think so because the uh, Indonesia is also, Indonesia is uh, just like the oxygen line of all the Southeast Asian countries. Everything is going from Indonesia. And uh, so Indonesian is also, if we see that uh, the graphics and the data, so it's a booming economy. So they have more potential. I don't think so that that is the case of the Sri Lanka. Regarding your uh, third part of the question about the South China Sea security issue. So the United States, in the name of the navigation, if they definitely go near China, they would not be welcome. Because this is not their territory. They have to live away. If Chinese go near there, of course they have the problem. But while they not consider this. So regarding China's position, it's very clear. They respect the international maritime law. They, inter, uh, they respect the international country's sovereignty in this case. And uh, I'm not much expert deeply about the South China Sea. But overall, I think that their uh, policy is not to intervene and to respect. But in the name of the navigation, if US will come close, of course, they will not be welcome. They will have to be uh, kicked out because they cannot. Uh, it could be the same case like the um, US would like to come into the Ukraine. Where just 400 kilometers, the Moscow is the capital. Why they allow United States just like to come very near? So, in the same case, if the US will come in the name of the navigation, though they have the so-called strategic partners in Asia Pacific, uh, Japan and Korea, but of course uh, China will not allow because China is uh, emerging power, and they have concerns about this kind of the United States presence near. Uh, South China Sea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sambal. Thank you, Tofan. Um, yeah, about the depth trap, I would like to, I should have asked that about that um, earlier, but yeah. Um, any other questions maybe from the audience here, since we haven't received any question from YouTube? Yeah. I'm sorry. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Lutfi, and uh, thank you, uh, Ayub. Um, I just want to look at from the uh, perspective of uh, geopolitical rivalry, you know, geopolitical competition. We see that, uh, particularly what I receive from the uh, public perception, actually. You know, we see that uh, between, this is actually geopolitical conflict and competition between uh, China from one side and US and Western other side. Uh, uh, one widely perceived that uh, what both of the major pro is doing is the same thing. What the difference is just the approach. So U.S. and and Western, they, they mostly like like you uh, you said before that they mostly prefer uh, using the hard approach. They come uh, with physical presence, with military power. They change the politics, the government, and they change the uh, uh, the government that in front of them. So this is actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, a kind of uh, new imperialism, actually. But what uh, the China is doing right now is the same thing. Just China is using what we call self approach, using the economic uh, approach, economic power. So people say, uh, you know, BRI is just uh, another instrument of this new colonialism. So China, rather than using, oh. Uh, you know, military power, they come also to other countries with the economic power. Uh, they offer the, the, the investment, you know. Uh, so uh, people also like what happened with in Sri Lanka, particularly related to the, the, in, the China investment in the seaport of Sri Lanka that, you know, the government of Sri Lanka cannot pay for the rent. And then right now the seaport was taken over by the China for decades in the future. So. Uh, and the case as well, probably the government of Malaysia, for instance, they just cancelled uh, a big project of the uh, uh, high-speed railway that connected uh, Malaysia and, and Malaysia and Singapore. There was it's also the uh, the, inf the 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 investment of Chinese the government, and they cancelled it. So uh, this is actually some of the uh, public perception of this. So what? What these two measures 
uh, doing uh, the same thing. What, what the difference is just uh, the approach, hard approach and soft approach. Uh, I just want to you know, see your comment on this. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you very much, uh, Hassan Asuri. It's a very good question. And I think that that is uh, being discussed into the different intellectuals and the scholars. So the soft approach and the hard approach. So it's very clear that uh, China have a business mind. They try to come and uh, they try to share in the partnership rather than the hard approach. But they are not, I mentioned this repeatedly, that they are not in any kind of the intention to intervene or to rule any other country. China has never been. You may see the Chinese history, thousands and thousands of years after, they never came out for the purpose of any kind of the uh, intervention or aggression. It's very really clear. Regarding the uh, economic activities, China Silk Road, the ancient Silk Road was the hub of the trade. It was previously there. So regarding the uh, Malaysia case, uh, you mentioned that the Malaysia Singapore. Uh, so it's it's of it's of course depend on the the first decision is the, about the people of the country and then the government of the country. If any government is not comfortable, they can linger on, they can pace down, or they can slow the projects according to their own requirements. But overall, we see that the propaganda of the West is too much in this case, and it's. It's affecting because they they try to influence, they try to pressurize the governments through different means of way, just like the blockage because the West is feared. Because if this development will come, especially those countries who are who have not who are underdeveloped countries, where uh, the people have not uh, much awareness about the uh, about the future and all this kind of the stuff. At that time, they see that. Of course, there is the people have the Western idealization, Western countries, Western uh, system of governance. They have been visualizing and idealize, uh, idealizing for years and years. So when you see that now the China is uh, trying to give attraction to the world, of course, they have all kind of the channels that they will use uh, to propagate and to manipulate such kind of the issues. So, but uh, that is soft power. I think is that is much better than the Western hard and the hegemonic power. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sambal and uh, Pan Sori. Is there any other um, question from our audience, maybe here? Okay, because um, we still we, we are we are still waiting for if there is any uh, other question, Dr. Samba. It reminds me that also in your slide as well, you say that um, again, the country China is one of my highlights of the Western uh, powers. But then we see that the BRI itself, it covered, it already expanded to 70 countries that in, included uh, the Western powers. We have Italy, we have Netherlands covered by the BRI. So what, what, what do you think about uh, that um, uh, when you are saying that the Western powers, uh, one of the main, main aim of the Western powers to, to, um, to stop China, what, what do you think? If we see that the BRI itself also covered this Western power growth. Yes, the, in BRI we see a lot of European countries there. Italy is one of the leading players in BRI. So uh, the European tries to influence even there. But the problem is this, that they cannot, the European bloc, they cannot influence much because they have also a very big division there. The smaller countries are treated very badly there in the European Parliament, in that they don't respect. Even in the case of the Poland, we see last time what was the, uh, the statements coming from the European Union, very hard and very harsh. So uh, after Brexit, uh, we see that there are uh, three major players now in European Union. That is the France, Germany, and uh, uh, the uh, France, France, Germany are the two major players. So I think that the most of the interest and the most of the uh, monopoly and the control are the are the bigger states. The rest of just like uh, uh, being being heard in the sheep's all the sheep have been going on like this. Yeah. So the the, the problem is this that uh, West is also dependent on China now, but they don't admit this openly. 
they are engaging into a lot in german in germany there are a couple of ports i think uh, uh, they have been actually uh, taken over by china so simultaneously the, uh, the all the trade and everything uh, from china they're going on but in terms of the asia pacific and we talk uh, the west and the especially the united states like we see that this uh, uh, indo pacific doctrine what is this akus what is that so mean that these are actually the uh, Uh, the gestures and the strategies that the West is trying to engage and uh, to stop the development, uh, it's very clear. Uh, but I think that most of the Asia Pacific are not uh, trying to buy these Western, uh, Western narratives and uh, the Western uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sumbal. Um, now, Dr. Sumbal, we have uh, audience from our universities uh, around Jakarta. Uh, the back side of that um uh, we are well uh, we want to wait if there is question from uh, our audience back there however if um while we are waiting for that i would also add something that um uh, it actually connects to the bri and actually chinese investment in indonesia that the habibi center who have just finished one of our research in regards of the um um chinese investment in jakarta bandung um, high speed uh, railway and we have just um, uh, actually disseminated the result uh, the, the findings yesterday and it is interesting to see that um, one of the uh, one of the uh, maybe I would say the system the mechanism of the, the investment itself um, in regards to the uh, uh, national or local law which China is about to invest in um they gave priority to they gave priority to uh to to how the local or national law uh regulates particular things which it includes a um a guidelines technicalities and stuff and then their um their their own law the chinese law um i think it was the listed as third uh priorities to actually uh, regulate those things, uh, those Chinese investment things in particular countries. And related with the one in, happened in Sri Lanka, that trap actually. Would China, uh, what I would like to ask your opinion, or maybe how do you see about how China see uh, uh, The, 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 the circumstance happened in specific countries when it was about to uh, to enter and uh, to give uh, outward funding to their development and infrastructure projects such as in Sri Lanka. Would that actually, uh, um, would China actually see the political uh, circumstances that would happen and would potentially block and barrier how uh, the, 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 the The, the development and the, fin the financial problem in, in, in this particular country, or what do you, what do you, how do you see that? Of course, I think that the political uh, stability is the is the guarantee of the any success of any project. But uh, if there is a country is a political stable and there are projects going on, but immediately there is some political instability emerged. And uh, the development sector has been stopped. So that is, of course, it's very unusual. And then there is a question mark on this: that where this political instability is coming? I mean, who is trying to replace the governments, and who is trying to uh, maneuver and uh, manipulate uh, the ground realities of that specific country? So it's another form of, you can say that the conflict are uh, some sort of the uh, collision of the power. And it is, we see that uh, this political instability has been, has been brought up. Just like in Pakistan, again, there was the regime change recently. Uh, though the previous prime minister he was not uh, even much clear in his ideas and his in his foreign policy but uh, when his regime was changed 
he is accused uh, the western powers uh, americans that americans have taken down him from his government so of course this is the major point and uh, the political and the economic risk assessment every government they do because this is uh, the well calculation is actually the those countries who who invest they must have some ground uh, realities and the surveys on the basis of which they will do uh, i am not much uh, involved in this process because my major is actually the conflict and the geopolitics but uh, uh, exactly uh, the the political instability definitely uh hindrance and put the stop to various uh, projects thank you thank you dr samba um maybe there are other questions from the audience yeah please thank you maslutpi and pak ayub uh, it was very interesting presentation. My name is Aji from International Relations of Windows University. I just would like to follow up uh, previous questions uh, from the three questions before. Uh, I am fully agree with the conditions of the instability political regarding of the interfere or influence from the China's within uh, BRI's uh, project that uh, we found in the field that the problem of instability is coming from the gaps and uh, disparity between the benefit from each parties. We can see so far that China is still have a bigger uh, beneficiary rather than the locals or the house country. So uh, I would like to give you a little bit of uh, examples when one of my research is in a traditional market in Surakarta, we have a, a traditional batik market. Uh, in, the, in this market, uh, one of the value is because of handcrafted uh, batiks. And today, we already see a lot of uh, artificial uh, batiks motif that's coming from China. So that's in this case is proof that uh, replacing the market it causes the replacing of the stability political in certain level of only in a small uh, market batiks in Surakarta. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much for your presentations. You give uh, us with a different perspective, but in the reality, we find that, that the simple. Uh, simple uh, examples that the instability still there because of their eyes uh, projects. Thank you very much. For your uh, analysis, I think it's your observation and uh, I do respect it because it's you are from that part. So you must have the better analysis than me. So it's depend about the case to case even. But uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I think that I agreed with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sambal. Thank you, uh, Pa Aji. Um, our university friends, do you have any questions in regards to the BRI? Maybe is it related to your study, or yeah, okay. Um, Dr. Sambal, do you have uh, any remarks to actually uh, conclude your 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 uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, Habibi Center and all the participants and I think I really appreciate a lot of questions. It means that uh, uh, it was a very interactive session and we will try to keep this space in future as well. I am really happy to visit uh, Habibi Center. Thanks again Mr. Uh, Brother Hassan Ansari and uh, uh, from the center, uh, Ilham, Mr. Ilham also. And uh, thanks for Mr. Uh, Lutfi for his moderating of a beautiful session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Samba. We are looking forward to have you uh, back here again uh, in, in, in the near future, and hopefully uh, we'll see you again really soon. Yeah. Uh, now we'll have a bit of gift to you. Uh, 
Stefan, sorry. Maybe you can sit here. 